We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today. We're going to turn there. It will be on the screen as well. There we go. Sorry about that. Acts chapter 2. Uh, Acts chapter 1. Here's what happens in Acts chapter 1. Jesus has his last meeting with the disciples before he ascends to heaven. And in that last meeting with the disciples, he tells them something pretty important. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, You are going to get power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. They had asked him a question. They said, God, is your kingdom coming right now? They were interested in like an earthly power, like they wanted to sit on thrones beside of Jesus. And Jesus said, no, you're going to get power, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit's power. And then you're going to be witnesses in in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, you're going to take my message, the message of the gospel everywhere. They were after Jesus ascended, they were supposed to go back to Jerusalem and pray and wait for the Holy Spirit. Like like good Christians, they went back to Jerusalem, they prayed, and they had a business meeting. Okay? And and they, they, they somebody said, oh, no, we only have 11 disciples because Judas was gone, right? He had betrayed Jesus, he had hanged himself, and he was gone. Oh, no, we've only got 11. we got to have 12. And so they elected a guy named Matthias, and scholars go back and forth. We're, we're, is this something they were supposed to do? Is this something they were not supposed to do? Because Jesus didn't say, go back and have a business meeting and pick the replacement for Judas. He said, go back and wait for the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting. That's the last time in the Bible where God's people use what was called casting lots to try to discern what God's will was. In the Old Testament, they would use casting lots. Sometimes the priest had this thing around their neck called the Urim and the Thummim, and and it was like rolling a dice or flipping a coin to try to discern the mind of God. And they didn't know who the, 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 the other disciple should be, the 12th disciple. A lot of scholars feel like it was probably supposed to be Paul. And Paul even says that in some of his writings. He says, Paul, an apostle, not by the choice of man, but by the choice of God. And so... Uh, they, they went back and they had a business meeting. They cast lots and the lot fell on Matthias. And so he became uh, the 12th disciple. By all accounts, he was a great guy. Um, so then they, they continue praying and waiting. And then that picks up the story now in Acts chapter 2. So if you've got your Bible and you want to read along, here we go. And we're just going to go through the text this morning. It's a, it's a lengthy text. We're going to park in a few places and then just make some application at the end. When the day of Pentecost arrived, so this is after Jesus has ascended, they were all together in one place, like we will be next Sunday. Uh, Not not two different things, but everybody in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, this kind of an event had happened several times in the Old Testament. You think of Isaiah's vision where smoke filled the house or, or when they dedicated the temple. And, and so this is a big event and this rushing wind and it fills the house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire, this, this sort of flame appears over each of them and rested on each one of them. And this isn't the first time something like this has happened either. When Moses designated some elders to help him judge and lead the tribes of Israel, this same kind of thing happened, and they began prophesying to show that God's Spirit was resting on them. So if you think about it, this is a way that just like Moses had designated his authority to those elders, Jesus is designating his authority to these uh, these apostles, and they now are going in his power. So uh, divided tongues appeared over and rested on them, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word here for tongues means languages, and I think it's supported here in the rest of the text. It wasn't just some sort of rambling, babbling, or gibberish. It was an actual language that they were speaking. And it wasn't a language that they knew. Like, they didn't grow up studying multiple languages. They just started speaking languages that they did not previously know. Now, verse 5 is where this is is kind of becomes more clear. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we are hearing each one of us in our own native language, like in in their own dialect even? 
And then it kind of gives a little list. Uh, and, and, and how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phagyra, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes are people who were born Jews and people who had joined Judaism, who had previously been Gentile, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own language, or our own tongues, the mighty works of God. So God does this amazing miracle where the apostles are able to speak languages that they didn't previously know. People are able to hear it in the dialect of the town in which they were born, and, and they're hearing the works of God in the language from where they were born. So it wasn't just some gibberish or something that was made up. It was a real language, a mighty miracle of God. All, it says, were amazed and perplexed. And they said to one another, well, what does this mean? This, this has to be happening for a reason. We've got this imagery from the Old Testament of this rushing wind. We've got the tongues of fire over people like we've had in the Old Testament. This has to mean something. There has to be a significance. But others mocked, and they said, no, they're just, they're just, they're drunk. They're filled with new wine. Some were able to hear the message, and some were blocking the message and being resistant to it. It kind of is similar to what we had talked about in Thessalonians, where for some they believe, and it's, and it's life to them, and for others it's the aroma of death. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only the third hour. In other words, the party didn't even start yet. There were, nobody's drunk yet. But this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel. Now, Peter is now going to go back to the Old Testament and quote a prophecy from hundreds of years before. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. This is going to be an outpouring of God's spirit that transcends uh, whether you're male or female, your sons and your daughters. It's going to transcend age, both old and young. Your young men will see visions. Your old men dream dreams. Even on, and it's going to transcend socioeconomics on, on the poor and the rich. Even on my male servants and my female servants, there were many people who were slaves back at this time. In those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. So this begins and it says, in the last days. Now, we just finished 2 Thessalonians, which was all about, hey, is this the last days? And the last days began on the day of Pentecost. And it looks like about every couple thousand years, there's a big thing that happens. If you look through biblical history, a couple thousand years, and then we have the flood. A couple thousand years, uh, you know, we get, you get Abraham. A couple thousand years, it, it just kind of continues like that. You have Jesus coming on the scene. And it's been a couple thousand years since the last days began. And so he says, this is, this is the last days. This is the beginning of the end. And now in verse 19, it talks about some things that you've probably read about in the book of Revelation. The end of the last days. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth below, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes. So this, this meshes right with what we just studied in the book of first, uh, Second Thessalonians, before that great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass. From the, in other words, from the beginning of the last days to the end of the last days, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That salvation is going to come by people placing their faith in Jesus and calling out to Jesus for salvation. Now Peter goes into an abbreviated sermon, and uh, the writer kind of says, and he also said many other words. But look at verse 22. Men of Israel hear these words, and he brings it right to Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. You could talk to people that Jesus had healed. They were still right there. This is just a few days after Jesus has ascended. Lazarus, you could talk to Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. You could talk to people who had seen the risen Christ. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. 
God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And now he's already quoted Joel. Now he quotes David in the Psalms. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my flesh will uh, also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, speaking of the death of Christ, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. In other words, Peter's saying, David's not talking about himself here. He's talking about somebody else. David's tomb's right down the road in the city of Bethlehem. So, and he's still buried there. David, he he both died and was buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And you can imagine as these people are sitting there hearing this and and they've seen everything that's happened in Jerusalem and they've certainly heard about Jesus and all the miracles and it was a massive phenomenon that came through. Now they're they're like, oh my goodness, the the one that the prophets foretold, David foretold, uh, Joel, all all of those prophets, and then we killed the Messiah? But God has raised him. And so look at what it says in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. It's the same message that Jesus preached. Remember, the gospel isn't just some option on a on a on a buffet line that we can kind of pick up and take if we want to No, the the gospel is a command to be obeyed. Repent. And believe the gospel. Repent, he says. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the, remi- for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, the people that Peter was speaking to right there in that immediate context. And for your children, your descendants, and those who are far off, you and me, sitting here today. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And if you are sitting here this morning as a Christian, God has called you to himself. He has filled you with his spirit. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word and were baptized and there were added that day about 3000 souls. A few verses later in the next uh, chapter or so, there's going to be another 5,000. The church of Jerusalem grew to a church of about 8,000 almost overnight. Now, not all of these people were from Jerusalem, though. Remember, in the early part of the text, they had come from all over the place. One of the places it specifically mentioned was Rome. And so they took the message of the gospel with them. When Paul wrote the letter to the church at Rome, what we call the book of Romans, Paul didn't start that church. That church was probably started by people right here on the day of Pentecost who believed the message of the gospel and traveled back to Rome and began a Christian community there in Rome. Those who received the word were baptized and were added that day 3,000 souls. Now, verse 42, and this is kind of the focus this morning. And they devoted themselves. So the Holy Spirit has filled them. They've been, they've repented of sin. They've received the gospel. They've been baptized. And this is what a spirit filled church looks like. 
First of all, devoted to the apostles' teaching. That's what we're doing right now, okay? It, doesn't, it can't just happen on a Sunday, but because uh, this says day by day, they met with one another or they met in the temple. But certainly when we gather each week for, for Bible teaching, that's dedicating ourselves to the apostles' doctrine. Now, think about it. The New Testament hadn't yet been written. So what were they doing for the apostles' doctrine? They were looking at the Old Testament and looking at all the ways that Messiah lined up with prophecy. And, and so they were looking back. We get the opportunity. We can look at both the Old and New Testament. But they were searching through and digging through the scriptures of the Old Testament, seeing how Jesus had fulfilled them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching or the apostles' doctrine. Next to fellowship, they, they devoted themselves. They said, we got to get together. We're in this together. Like when, when we have a breakfast and you're sitting around the table with people, that's, that's important. It's just as important as what we're doing right now. Like fellowshipping with one another is important, just like apostles' doctrine is important. We kind of think of fellowship as sort of some optional thing. Like, no, it's really important. And I'll tell you this, as the church becomes more and more persecuted, fellowship's going to start mattering more and more. You're going to need to know one another, to be able to pray for one another, to be able to share needs with one another, and fellowship does that. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread. That, that, that time in communion where Christ calls us to the table and we, we look at our relationships with other Christians, we look at our relationship with God and we look for that unity that he offers. The forgiveness of sin, the cleansing, and the opportunity to come to the table of our Lord. Breaking of bread and then lastly, prayer. This spirit-led church was known for their prayer. Then look at the results of this. All came upon every soul. Signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. These are miraculous happenings. I think things like this can still happen today. We, sometimes we pray for things, and there's the only way that that prayer could have been answered or could have been answered is if God did it. Like there was no human way possible for it to be answered. And God still heals, and God still answers prayers to this very day. A spirit led church, I believe, will see miraculous occurrence. And it probably won't look like what, what you see on television. Okay. Probably won't be a lot of fanfare or smacking someone on the forehead or any of that kind of stuff. It'll, it'll probably just be the quiet answers of prayer and God doing miraculous things. And signs and wonders were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together. They had unity had all things in common, this fellowship and the, the spirit were doing this work and they were together and had things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings. They, they had sacrificial generosity and they distribute the proceeds to all. You have to understand that as some of these early Christians were baptized, they, they went into the water as part of a family, as part of an inheritance. And when they came out of the water, they were cut off and they had no more family connection. Their families disowned them, thinking that they had joined a cult. And so other Christians had to care for these people who came out of the baptismal pool destitute. And so they gave sacrificially, selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any who had need. And day by day, they attended the temple together. And they broke bread in their homes. They didn't have sanctuaries like this. The temple was largely at this point in time, still a very Jewish situation. And so as Christians, they were saying, okay, we got to get together in homes. And they got together. And, and when they would gather for a meal with the other believers, they would break bread and say, this is the Lord's body. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. They praised God and they had favor with the people. I think because of their generosity, people looked and said, wow, there's something about these spirit-filled Christians. And then look at how their church grew. And they hired a consultant. They No, it says the Lord added to their number, what? Those who were... So people who didn't know Jesus were hearing the gospel getting introduced to Jesus, deciding to follow Jesus, and the Lord was adding to the church that way. So I think our goal as a church is, God, we want to be a spirit-filled, spirit-led church where 
the apostles' doctrine matters, where fellowship matters, where breaking bread matters, where prayer matters, where there's generosity, where there's unity. We care for one another. And, and that's a safe place for God to put baby Christians where they're going to grow up. It's a greenhouse where they can grow and be nourished and become strong. So the Holy Spirit does this work in the church collectively, but what does the Holy Spirit do in the individual life? Galatians answers that question. If you got your Bible and you want to turn there, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, calls it the fruit of the Spirit. We've seen what the Holy Spirit did for this group of early believers as a church, but what does it do in the individual life of a believer? The fruit of the Spirit, what should be growing in your life and my life? Love. I should be more loving today than I was a year ago because the fruit of the Spirit is growing in me. If I ever look at my, myself and honestly assess and say, I'm not as loving as I once was, something's wrong. I planted a couple apple trees, and I'm hoping to get apples someday. I, it may not work. I'm not a farmer. I try. Okay. I want my life, though, to produce fruit. Okay. I, I want there to be something on those branches. And, and if I look at my apple trees a few years from now and something hasn't happened, like, what's wrong with this tree, right? And so I want my life to produce love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy regardless of circumstance. Peace regardless of circumstance. Patience. I should have skipped over that one. That's a tough one. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. So that's what the Holy Spirit's doing in the individual life of each believer. And if you can imagine, if, if every Christian is growing in their love, their joy, their patience, their kindness, their goodness, their faithfulness, their gentleness, their self-control, those are the kind of people you're going to want to be around and I'm going to want to be around, right? Like, that's what I want. And, and, and I think we see that. I, I certainly see the fruits of the Spirit in this congregation. And when we fellowship together, we, we see it a little bit more. When we go through trials, we see it a lot. Because trials are where those fruits really come to the end of the branches. The Holy Spirit's not just doing something in our church collectively. It's doing something in the life of each believer. And so as a Christian, it's my job and it's your job to not quench the Holy Spirit, to not resist the Holy Spirit, but to yield, this is what the scripture says, to yield ourselves. And, and if I'm yielded to the Holy Spirit and you're yielded to the Holy Spirit and collectively we're yielded to the Holy Spirit, I, I believe we'll see amazing things. I believe we already are seeing some amazing things. So, I don't know how long I'll get to be on this planet and I don't know how long I'll get to serve as the pastor of this church. That stuff's up to God, right? But whenever those days come to an end, I want to always be able to look back and say, Things happen that can only be explained because the Holy Spirit showed up and did it. If, if everything happened that, and I can say, well, we had a good plan for that. And well, we had the resources for that. Like, I, no, I want to go beyond what my resources or our resources or our planning could come up with. And I want to see God do things that can only be explained by the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Lord, may we invite you into each life. Empower us, enlighten us, equip us for service, cause these fruits to grow in us, and Lord, cause us collectively to have unity, generosity, faithfulness, to be devoted to the apostles' teaching to be devoted to prayer and communion and fellowship. And, and Lord, I pray that as you work in us individually and you work in us collectively, that Christ would be exalted and you would draw people to yourself. And you would give us the opportunity to make many disciples. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.